states have rights that the federal government doesn't have. I'm not going to apologize for the rights of states to craft plans on a bipartisan basis that they think will help their people. No apology is the book, and no apology is Mitt Romney's answer when it comes to the Massachusetts health care law. And something tells me he's going to be saying that phrase over and over for the next 12 to 15 months. Top Line starts right now. Hello and welcome to ABC News Top Line. I'm Rick Klein. I'm Karen Travers. Every day at noon Eastern, we're right here bringing you the latest in politics. It's twitter.com slash rickkline, twitter.com slash Karen Travers. Karen, what has caught your eye today? Taste of tea. Yesterday in Florida, a federal judge ruled that the Obama administration's health care overhaul law was unconstitutional because of that individual mandate. And there is language in there that has Republicans and Tea Party activists very giddy. This is now the fourth federal judge to rule on this, the second that has said it's un un unconstitutional. But this goes a bit further because this isn't just an element of the bill. This is the entire bill. The White House says this is unsustainable and they expect that this will be uh, stayed while they figure out what to do next. That's right. And if you keep me score, it's now two to two mm -hmm. among federal judges. And everyone expects this to get to the Supreme Court, where the decision, you can almost guarantee, is going to be five to four. Yes. Which mm -hmm. way, of course, is the big question. But another big blow taking the legal foundations of the of the, uh, of the President Obama's health care law into question. Next up today, domino effect. We have seen the tentacles of Egypt extend throughout the region. The latest is in Jordan, where the, the, the king of Jordan has now uh, liquidated the government and, and has reorganized things in, in basically in reaction to what has happened in Egypt. And this is exactly the fear uh, of the of the Obama administration as they watch these events from afar is that this could spread in unpredictable ways. You have in this in this situation, Jordan trying to get ahead of it. But the question in the White House is what's next? What do you do inside of Egypt? What do you do elsewhere in the region where these images that we're watching are being broadcast across the world? And as those questions are still out there, you're seeing silence from President Obama. Another day today with nothing on his schedule where reporters could ask him questions. They don't want him saying right. anything as they wait this out and see where it goes. Next up, testing Tester. John Tester is going to have a challenge in his Minnesota, Montana Senate race from Denny Rareberg. He is going to run in 2012. This could be the closest Senate race. <laughs> we are going to have all eyes on Montana next year. And Rick, what do you think this means for the Democrats if this is one of the races they're really going to have to focus time, attention, and possibly money on? This is high on the Republican hit list, and they got now a, a top-tier challenger to take on Senator Tester. Senator Tester, I think, has got, got good, good approval ratings in his state is relatively popular. We'll see what the extent of the wave we saw in 2010. If it extends into 2012, it's going to be very hard for a Democrat in a state like Montana, no question. And speaking of 2012, next up and finally today, it is Carolina on his mind. The Democrats have chosen, with the White House approval, the, their site for the 2012 convention. It is Charlotte, North Carolina, and a signal from the White House that while North Carolina swung blue in 08 and back to red in 2010, they hope that it can come back into their column in 2012. They didn't go to a traditional swing state. They went into kind of the new battleground states, right. the states that the president was able to swing in his direction in 2008. Right. If you had to say which states would you have expected, perhaps Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, this is them trying to expand the map, saying we are still playing a very strong offense. The White House has been very clear from day one in 2009 that North Carolina was in their sights. Remember the Obama's vacation there yes. in 2010? You saw many, many visits from Obama, the first lady, the vice president, and even Jill Biden going down there. They want to have a presence there. And here's guessing that John Edwards is going to be vacationing far away from the state if the Obama White House has anything to do with we begin today's program with former Senator Norm Coleman, a Republican of Minnesota and the, the CEO of the American Action Network. Senator Coleman, thanks for being here. And I, I want to start with the events that we're seeing unfolding in Egypt. How, from your perspective, is the White House handling it? Should they be putting more pressure on President Mubarak to step aside? The White House is doing what they can do now, which is actually very little. Uh, we'll see how this thing plays out. Mubarak's going to be gone. Uh, there is a need for a transition period. If there's no transition period, and then the, uh, the Muslim Egyptian Brotherhood kind of moves in, I, and that's the great fear. This is not good for Israel. This is not good for America. On the other hand, Mubarak isn't going to be there. However, if there's one criticism I have, it's that the White House didn't have an active democracy agenda beforehand. And so all of a sudden now we are captive of the events. Uh, as things are playing out now, the White House is doing what it can do, which is really very, very little. So, Senator Coleman, are you saying they could have done something more? I mean, we're obviously talking a lot about the president's Cairo speech from 2009, but what could the White House have done in that democracy agenda to be in a better position right now with the situation in Egypt? 
I think the White House abandoned the democracy agenda because it was the Bush agenda. And had the White House been working uh, more closely with forces of democracy in Egypt, understanding that Mubarak could not continue on forever, that there had to be a, uh, an alternative, an answer somewhere down the road, uh, we might have been in a better position. Uh, listen, it's easy to kind of look back. That's the reality. Now the White House is doing what it can do. Uh, and that is kind of straddling. It's not casting Mubarak totally overboard, but the White House knows, I think the world knows, Mubarak's not going to be in charge of Israel in, in the near future. What we're hoping for now is simply a transition period to give legitimate forces of democracy, those people really concerned about civil society, perhaps folks who can keep the peace with Israel in place, give them a chance to organize. That's not the reality right now. A quick change would not be a good thing for Israel, not be a good thing for this country. Hopefully, we'll have some period of transition. Senator, I want to turn your attention a little bit to the work that you've been doing at the American Action Network, uh, particularly in outreach to Latino voters. And you organized a conference a couple of weeks ago to, to, try, to, to try to bring the party closer to Latino voters amid signs that, uh, that they've been drifting away a little bit. What signs are you seeing on Capitol Hill and beyond that the Republican Party can win back the, the trust and the support of Latino voters? Well, the election of uh, Marco Rubio in Florida, uh, the reality of the two Hispanic governors, new Hispanic governors of both Republicans, uh, the reality of a Hispanic uh, winning a seat in Idaho, congressionally, that's not a Hispanic district, uh, Raul Labrador, uh, is a good thing for our party. All that said and done, we've got a problem. Uh, Hispanics represent the largest ethnic minority group, the largest, fastest growing ethnic minority group, 30% of the U.S. population by 2050, and we have a problem. We have a tone problem and we have a reality problem, but the opportunity is there. You're seeing it with the folks who are being elected. You're seeing it with the simpatico with the Hispanic community on family issues, on trade issues, on, on entrepreneurial small business issues. But we have some challenges that we have to address. American Action Network is kind of stepping out into that. Uh, we're going to you know, talk about a solution to immigration. Somehow, somewhere between chipping everybody out and, and amnesty, there's got to be a solution. Uh, we have to address this issue because if we don't, uh, we're not going to be a majority party in the, in the future. Senator, you say it's a tone issue, but some Hispanic groups say it's more than just that. It, or it's a fact. It's the issues. So what do you expect or what, what would you like Republicans in Washington to put forward on an agenda over the next year or two to put you in a better position for 2000, 2012 so Republicans can uh, win back Hispanics? Let me be very clear. It's not just a tone issue. It's a substance issue. Well, we have to be very clear in rejecting Tom Tancredo is saying he's not the voice of the Republican Party on issues dealing with Hispanics immigration. Uh, what we have to do is simply have a proactive agenda. There are some issues where we have an advantage. We have an advantage of a party that supported trade. The Columbia Free Trade, the Panama Free Trade agreements are agreements that should be put through. Uh, there are a lot of Hispanics who are concerned about those things. That's in our wheelhouse. There, there are family issues. There are tax issues. We've got a lot in our wheelhouse. We have to be, I, I think, more open on dealing with immigration, understanding that there are legitimate concerns about border security and being aggressive in that regard, but not limiting the conversation to simply talking about border security. So we've got to kind of step out a little stronger on this. It's not just tone. I, I, I agree with those who say it's more than tone, but tone is, is, is still part of the problem. Senator, I want to get your quick thoughts on, on 2012. A couple of Minnesotans, your home state, uh, folks are making some serious noises. Tim Pawlenty and Michelle Bachman among them. Do you have any favorites in that, in that category? I have a lot of friends, but I always stick with my friends. Uh, and Tim Pawlenty's out there. Michelle Bachman's out there. Our, our neighbor, John Thune, is, you know, there are some rumblings. We've got a lot of opportunity in 2012. All that said and done, the president's still got the edge. It's still tough to defeat an incumbent president. Uh, on the other hand, if this president doesn't move more aggressively to do some things to move this economy forward, if, if the unemployment rate is hovering at 9, 9.5 percent, uh, there's going to be a new president. So I've got a lot of friends, uh, and, uh, and I'll stick with my friends. Senator, how about your own opportunities for 2012? Are you considering a possible challenge to Senator Klobuchar? Uh, I will state, uh, I'll make news here, I'm not going to run against Amy Klobuchar. Uh, it's, I, I've said uh, in, in other forums that I haven't ruled out public service, my heart's in public service at some point, uh, but, but not in 2012. 
I, I, I love what I do now, and that is developing center-right policy, including things like working with the Hispanic community through the American Action Network. And also, we did a lot of supporting candidates that uh, em embrace center-right ideas. We picked up a lot of congressional seats uh, this last cycle, a number of Senate seats. I think 2012 is going to be a good year for our team. Uh, I think America is a center-right nation. We saw a reflection of that in this election. We'll see it in 2012. But I'm not going to run against a Amy Klobuchar. I'll leave that task to others. All right. Former Senator Norm Coleman of the American Action Network, appreciate you being here and making some news. We like news. Great pleasure. Thank you.